you know, the U.S. banking system is both complex and simple. We've lost about a thousand banks since this great recession began. A thousand banks. The U.S. has more banks in all of Canada, Asia, Europe, combined. We have about 7,500 banks left. So it's a very competitive in environment for us in the U.S. Our consumers obviously have a lot of choice. But the four biggest banks have probably, I, I think it's like 70% of the assets. J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citibank, uh, and Wells Fargo. We have this phenomenon, uh, you have it here as well, it's called community banks. We have a lot of those in the United States. Uh, and they play a vital role in our economy, in our very entrepreneurial economy of the United States. 40% of the small business loans come from community banks less than $1 billion in size. 40%. So you can see community banks play a very important role because basically America, yes, you've heard of AT&T and IT&T, but basically America is a small business uh, country and Florida is obviously one of those. We're, we don't have a lot of Fortune 500s headquartered in Florida uh, and uh, we're basically a small business economy. Uh, we're a reflection of the, of the country. So community banks play a vital, vital role. Um, and so 2008, how, how did we get there? Uh, you know, it really all started in 1999. We had these two, what we call GSEs, Government Supported Enterprises, which were started by the federal government and then they uh, became publicly traded entities and they buy mortgages in the secondary markets and encourage home ownership in America, which is very high. Uh, and they lowered their credit standards in back in 1999. They wanted more Americans to, to, to own homes. And they, their standards for mortgages went down. And more mortgages were made leading up to 2008. Uh, and, um, and of course, you know, when you're making these loans, whether you're a bank or a non-bank, most banks don't keep it on their portfolio anymore. But the way we're regulated, uh, pretty much as President Obama pointed out in his white paper when he created a new banking regulator and for banks and non-banks called the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which was part of Dodd-Frank, uh, it was found in that white paper that 94% of the, of the more toxic loans, which we call subprime, were made by the non-banks. And these, what we call liar loans. You know, typical, you know, we have these mortgage brokers. It's an industry we have. And then these loans were sold. They were securitized, sold in the secondary market, sold to investors around the world, uh, and mortgage-backed securities. And uh, they're in your index funds. When you look, you should see what is the percentage of mortgage-backed uh, securities you had. S&P, you had uh, Standard, you know, the, the other Moody's, and then the third one, I always forget, rating agencies, and they put AAA on that. So you were an investor in, in, in Edinburgh, you were an investor in uh, Los Angeles, California, and you told your broker, I want AAA, that's all I want, I want a safe, conservative investment, and so you got mortgage-backed securities. And then as soon as people, um, the economy dipped, people lost their jobs, interest rates went up, because these were exotic mortgages, interest only. Most of our mortgages used to be 15, 30 year fix. We got into interest only. Um, so these are, I'm gonna talk about all, all this in a minute, but these are the type of things that started occurring leading up to 2008. And then finally, the, the, bu the bus finally crashed on what we call Columbus Day weekend um, in 2008. This is the New York Times front page that I kept from 2008. Our Dow went up 936 points that day because the government 
started putting out TARP, which was to assist the banks with capital. They called it TARP, it's really a capital purchase plan. Uh, TARP is Toxic Asset Repurchase Plan. They were going to buy the toxic assets of banks, and that's why it was called TARP, but they couldn't price it. So they decided to buy, you know, like bank shares, which was easier to price. Uh, but that was that weekend in mid October was, as we say, all hell broke loose. Uh, we didn't know what the markets would be like, and they went up and down like this for weeks, gaining 500 points, losing 600, uh, you know, and so on and so on. After 9/11, when our nation was attacked, and our Nasdaq, which is our technology footy. That bursted, and that, that bubble burst. It got up to 5,000. It's never been at 5,000 ever since. It's, I think it's 3,500 right now. A lot of people lost a lot of money. People took money out of the market, and where did they run to? Real estate. And that drove up prices because people started investing. And we looked at real estate as a utility of, of the time. You know, you're never going to lose money with that. You will in the markets, but not in real estate. Um, and then Mr. Greenspan, our head of our Bank of England, I guess you could say, at a, the Federal Reserve Bank, kept interest rates low. And I'm not going to be critical of him. I thought he was a great Fed chairman. We call him Fed chairman. Mr. Bernanke is now. Because uh, he did what he thought was best at the time. But he kept those interest rates probably now being a Monday morning quarterback, looking at things from a, with hindsight. He probably kept rates lower than they were should have for maybe too long. And with easy credit, with home prices soaring, I remember talking to friends who were moving to Washington, D.C., and they were telling people, hey, you better buy a condo now, because that condo was worth 500000 last year. It's worth 600000 this year. So you better buy it now, because it's probably going to be worth 700000 next year. You'll have $100,000 in equity just like that. So you better buy now. And they did. It went down to $200,000 when the recession hit. We call that being on the water. They did still hold the mortgage of five, six, seven hundred thousand, even though the property was not worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars or less. The signs were coming in February of '07. One of your banks, HSBC, warned us. We probably didn't pay attention, but they were, wrote off tens of billions of dollars in a subprime lender that they bought called Household Finance in the United States. That didn't work. I remember when they bought that, I, I didn't know why they were, I think they wanted to make those branches and transform that into bank branches, and it just never worked. And basically, they shut it down, they wrote off. And that should have been a, a, a warning sign for all of us, but it wasn't. Um, in August of the same year, a few months later, BNP Paribas in France froze withdrawals on three investment funds, and the panic began. And you know, in our industry, in our profession, if you don't have trust of the public, Jim, as you well know, you're doomed. But 08 was tough. Citibank wrote off 60 bil billion. Wachovia, one of our major banks that failed, that was taken over by Wells Fargo in what we call those shotgun winnings, uh, 52 billion. Merrill Lynch, 52 billion. Washington Mutual also failed. That was a big bank for us. J.P. Morgan took them over, um, $45 billion. I'm not even going to tell you what they lost in 2009 and 10. some of these. USB, $44 billion. HSBC, $27 billion. Bank of America, $21 billion. J.P. Morgan, $18.8 billion. Morgan Stanley, $16 billion. And Deutsche Bank, $15 billion. So, 
These mortgages were traded into derivatives and sold across world markets. And this is the crisis that we were in. Unemployment went up, confidence went down, you know, add government spending to that. What a formula in the laboratory to blow things up, huh? And um, that's how we got here. What are the solutions? Because I want to take your questions, I really do. Real quickly, one of the positives about Dodd-Frank, and, and I'm concerned about the regulatory environment in America for our community banks. Our community banks you know, have 20 employees, 50 employees, you know, 100 employees. They don't have a big staff. I worry, and I've told this to the regulators, when you have as many compliance staff, and I'm a lawyer too, but in all due respect to the lawyers in this law firm, uh, you, you can't, I mean, you can't have as many compliance or more compliance staff than lending staff. That's not what the world is about. Bankers are in the business of enhancing the economic vitality of the communities they serve, not the legal business. So Dodd-Frank um, is bringing a lot of regulation, uh, new regulation to our profession. But one of the good things about Dodd-Frank was too big to fail will end. Two, Basel III. I think Basel III is going to be good uh, to raise the capital standards of our bigger institutions. We're, we've got a problem in the U.S. right now. We're fighting Basel III from having to be applied to our community banks. It wasn't meant for our community banks. It was meant for the 50 systemic risk banks of the world. But Basel III will be good. We have now stress testing for our bigger banks where you, know, you basically get on a treadmill and you know, the banks are get on. Again, they, 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 they go through a stress test every year uh, by the Fed, our Bank of England. And just to make sure that you know, the muscles are working well, the heart's working well, everything's working well, that's a good thing. That way you prevent things before, you, know, you stop that truck before it hits the wall. That's a good thing, that's a good thing. Um, and the last thing is, and I hope you've had a chance to view this, is these 22 commandments of lending. If you don't have a copy, we'll get one to you. I, I think you did receive it, but if you didn't, you know, some of these may apply to you, some may not. But if your bank is operating here in, let's say, in Edinburgh, and that's where all your branches are, don't make loans out of territory. It's not an area you know. And again, I'm just sharing what we did in the U.S. I'm using this as an example here in Edinburgh. Don't make a second mortgage, a big second mortgage behind a large first mortgage. Uh, don't accept outside real estate appraisals without checking the property. You'd be surprised when you go out there and you say, what? Don't make a loan to an industry you don't understand. You ever have someone explain something to you and say, hey, I got this great idea. You go, oh yeah, what, what's that? Uh, so I go to Jim, I, Jim, you know, let's, let's take derivatives and let's put them in the market and let's do this and let's do that. And, and Jim says, uh, wait, wait, um, I must be having a tough day. Can you explain that again? So I explain it again to him. My recommendation to Jim, if you didn't get it the second time, don't do it. A lot of people got into this mess by doing stuff they did not understand. They did not understand. Don't make a loan because the competition will. If I don't make it, the competition will. Let the competition make that loan. Don't, as the CEO, if any of you are the CEOs, I think there's, we have a, quite a few in here, or senior executives. Make sure you supervise your lending staff. That was a problem for some of our banks that failed. The CEO had never made a loan. He didn't know what a loan, how to make a loan. You better know. You better know. 
Don't ever think that thou art smart enough to lend to a crook. Don't lend, lend money to a personal friend. That's an old one. Or relative. Certainly don't ever lend money to a political person. I can tell you some sad stories on that. That happened. That loans were made to people based on his or her political title and standing in the community. Don't ever steal a problem from a competitor. I'm going to steal a problem loan from a competitor. Yeah. It's going to be your problem now. Don't ever think that thou wearest a bulletproof vest. Because everything I touch turns to gold. I'm that good. That's one of the problems that, not only in our profession, but it, when the economy was soaring in the mid 10 years ago, 2003, 2004, 05, we got so cocky. We thought we were so good that every dart we threw against the dartboard hit bullseye. Including the, and we got to the point where we said, hey, watch me. Watch how good I am. And blindfolded myself and boom! Don't compromise your, this is an important one, don't compromise your credit standards in order to make your budget. Let's approve that, Mom. Yeah, normally I wouldn't, but let's do it so we can be budget. Don't take anything or anyone for granted. This is a big one. I, I don't know how to explain your system of checking in your court system, uh, but I advise our bankers, don't ever, ever make a loan to Harry when you find out through our court system that Harry's been sued by three other banks who are not paying. What, are you kidding? If Harry didn't pay them, guess what? He's not going to pay you. Don't. Don't do it. Even if Harry says, oh, but I had a problem with them. It, it, it's not going to be with you. You know, you're different. I'm going to be okay. We're going to have a great relationship. Don't believe Harry. Don't be wild about Harry, okay? Don't fail to respect your loan review and regulatory examiners, for they have something you can never have is objectivity. Don't fail to honor thy loan policy, for it will protect you from yourself. Stay with your loan policy. That's why you created it. Oh, you know what? We normally don't make Harry. Okay, our loan policy says only give three loans per customer. Harry wants another loan. Let's do it. Yeah. He's a good guy. I like him. Don't. Don't do it. I'm telling you, stay with your policy. Don't fail to advise your board that fast and high growth is unhealthy and not good for the bank. It's like losing weight. You don't want to lose 50 pounds in a week. You don't want to gain 50 pounds in a week. Some of our banks grew too fast. And guess what? You remember the line from E.T., the movie? Trouble. Remember that? Here's a big one. And I'll stop with this one. And by the way, always do risk management. Do it every week. I mean, do it as much as you can at your institution. Um, but... The last one I want to mention is, I remember walking into banks. Hey, Joe, how's it going? Hey, Alex, great. You know, I visit my bankers. I visit my presidents around the state of Florida. And uh, Alex, we just got this new client. Oh, my God, we're so happy to have him or her. Oh, really? Yeah, well, well, why is that? Oh, man, his net worth? Oh, God, it's like $20 million. Oh, really? Wow, what a new client. Congratulations. What does net worth really mean? After this great recession, we need to redefine what net worth means. Because let me tell you something. Cash is king. 
How much liquidity do you have, sir? Don't, you know, it's great. Oh, I got all this. I made this loan, Alex. I got all this collateral to protect me in case something goes wrong. Okay, that's great. In good times, when one loan here or there goes to default, you got the collateral and that's okay. I mean, that's good. That's a good practice, obviously, right? But when bad times come and a lot of loans go bad, bankers are not in the property management business. You don't want all that collateral. Make sure there's cash flow in that business. Mistakes were made. Lessons were learned. But our bankers do so much in sponsoring so much in the communities that they serve, that you serve. So I, I encourage you, keep your heads hanging high no matter what level of criticism you're hearing out there because our bankers, and it'll pass, it will pass. Trust me, it will. And I'm very confident of that. <laughs>